Hey! Hi, this is Dr. Christine. And Dr. Colin. And we are your co-hosts for the exciting new podcast called Love, Love Scrubs, Scrubs, and Stories, where we dive deep into the world of dating and relationships and go beyond the people wearing the white coats, the scrubs, and the stethoscopes. Come join us on this journey where we engage in dialogue and share stories of love, heartbreak, resilience, and triumphs. And we also navigate our professional lives with our hearts on our sleeves. Please remember to subscribe and hit the notification button to stay up to date on all future episodes. And, and we, we look, look forward, forward to, to seeing, seeing you inside. inside. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining to the Love Scrubs and Stories podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Colin Zhu, founder of The Chef Doc. And this is, and I'm joined by my lovely co-host. Dr. Christine Nguyen, a founder of White Coat Romance. We are so excited today. We have another exciting episode to share with you all and a a wonderful guest. Uh, We're going to be covering the topic of partner selection, which, you know, is a really, really important topic, right? You think about all the time and the dedication that we put into a career, but, you know, often we may not put as much thought and time into our uh, selecting our partner because finding your person can affect pretty much all aspects of your life, right? Your health, your wealth, and even (laughs) your sanity. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before I, you know, we begin, um, if you guys are new to our space, you know, this is for everyone in the world of medicine, whether you're single or in a committed relationship. And we like to share these stories, these untold stories and conversations uh, from these healthcare professionals. And, you know, they're just great journeys of love, heartbreak and resilience. So make sure you, you know, smack that, you know, subscribe button. So Christine, you know, we're talking about partner, you know, criteria and selection, you know, that means something different, you know, for different people, right? And depending on, you know, what walk of life you come from, culture, custom, it's different. It looks different, right? And on Netflix, we have, you know, things like Jewish and Indian matchmaking. And so, you know, there's always, and this has been going on for a very, very long time. So do you have something from, you know, your world that you could share with us that, you know, you, you know, that relates, you know, to to this on some level? You mean sort of like an arranged marriage sort of? vibe yeah does the uh, does the Vietnamese you know arrange you know their latter generations I don't know yeah I it, it, it's, it's really interesting how you know what what it used to be like in terms of how uh, couples get together in terms of like you know whether through introduction through family or through friends and, uh, and yeah and I, so actually when I grew up my parents attempted they, they tried they tried to set me up with uh, a nice boy from uh, you know a family friend they just thought that you know because the, our parents you know got along so well and um, there's alignment in terms of like family values and just life goals that you know their kids would be a good match for one another and uh i was just like i literally like shut them down so fast i kid you not and i felt so bad thinking about it at that time because i was just like no you know he's probably gonna be like you know uh just all these assumptions right like you know he's probably just gonna be like just financially stable because that's all they care about you know but but what if like you know i'm not attracted to him or what if like we don't have any chemistry you know and so yeah so that was my little snippet of uh of my family's attempt to set me up with someone. How old were you or what time period? What, like in your 20s, 30s? Yeah, I was in my 20s. I was in college. And yeah. And so I remember my dad coming to me and talking about it, you know, and I never even like met this person. I'm sure he was a very wonderful, nice, great guy, you know? So to this day, I actually, you know, I never, I don't even know who it is, but <laughs> I was, was just that whole idea of it. I was like, what is this? We live in the modern world. <laughs> like, True, um, true, true. But you never know, right? Um, yeah, you never know. And, and it doesn't mean that obviously now that, you know, we, especially from like these, you know, shows that we've seen and, and, you know, and like you said, everyone's really different in terms of, you know, where their culture, you know, and how they go about in like, you know, selecting a partner, you know, but for me, I definitely was not ready in in that mindset at that time. And I was very much, and I think also because I was just very much focused on school. And so, yeah. And so I always kind of like, oh, that will happen at some point, you know, but then, you know, like you think about it, like, do you want to leave something so important like this to chance or should we go about it in a more, you know, I guess like a more, I don't know, you want to call it protocol fashion? You know, I think that's probably the wrong word to use. But do you want to want to design it and have a path that will 
potentially lead you to more success? You know, what are your thoughts on the on partner selection? So, I mean, I have many thoughts on this and, you know, being a East Asian descent as well. And, you know, having your previous generation, you know, having their own thoughts and, you know, coming, uh, you know, from their own world and different societal, you know, uh, values and things like that. Uh, you know, they, at the end of the day, they mean well, right. They have Absolutely. good intentions. They want you mm-hmm. to find a solid partner, you know, in the Asian, you know, uh, culture, it's really about stability. It's really about certainty, stability, knowing that you're going to be set up well, set up for success. Well, right. And whether you're attracted to not, it's, you know, that's kind of like lowest on the priority. I think <laughs> the sure. American, the American way of dating has been, you know, just, you know, just different, right. You know, we're more like, you know, okay, if we're not attracted to them, then, you know, but you know, you just never know until you give it a chance, you give it an opportunity. Um, and it's worked for so many of like now, you know, uh, of our friends that we know about. Yeah, too. And exactly. so, so yeah, I'm, I'm I, like, I this, think, there's something I about think, it, right? Yeah. It, why it depends on how you think it? about it. I think it depends on how you think about it. And, you know, it just also depends, like you said, where you are in your life. You know, if you are not ready, then you're just not going to be ready. But if you're ready, and let's just say you've gone through the ringer, you've gone through the gauntlet, you know, it's worth a try. You know, what's the worst case scenario? You know, you go on a date and you say, you know, you just, you know, don't have a fit and then you go about, you know, you you move on with your life. So, so I think there's pros and cons to it. So. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. There could be like some sort of a hybrid of some sorts, you know? So anyway, so we have an exciting uh, guest today and who is going to address this topic of partner selection. Very excited to have her come on. Her name is Dr. Nasir. Let me briefly introduce her. She is an osteopathic family medicine and addiction medicine specialist from Santa Barbara, California, uh, currently working in a methadone clinic as an addiction medicine specialist. She went to West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine and did her internship in Fresno, California, and wrapped up her residency in Elmira, New York. 13 years ago, she met her husband when starting medical school after being introduced to each other by family. After eight long years of long-distance marriage, thanks to career pursuits, they finally settled down and ended up having two beautiful children. Now, after acquiring the most wanted things in life, Sarah is now working on creating a legacy. She has established Transcendent You, a holistic career coaching service with goals to help individuals dream define, design their destinies, and transcend their limits to fill and grow into their purpose. What an amazing, amazing bio. Let's welcome Dr. Sarah Nasir to the Love, Scrubs, and Stories podcast. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 (laughs) How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be here, Colin and Christine. It's it's an honor to be here, and it's such an amazing uh, initiative that you guys have taken to talk about all the different types of relationship success stories and struggles. So I hope that, you know, your audience who joins and listens are at least inspired or have their hearts warmed. If the best thing would be if they can find the courage and the answers or some ideas on how to, you know, achieve their own happily ever after, because I believe happily ever after is something that requires a lot of planning and a lot of orchestration to make sure that it is a success. That's awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time out. You know, it's uh, everyone's story is very unique. And, you know, when we heard about you know, your story, we're like, OK, she, she's got to come on. And, you know, we're also colleagues as well. We went to, you know, the same medical school alma mater. So, you know, uh, really, really, you know, good to you know see you again. So let's start mm-hmm. off, you know, before you and your partner came together, what at that time, you know, what what was going on um, in your life in terms of how you viewed partnerships and relationships, you know, from a personal standpoint, and if you wanted to share from a cultural, you know, standpoint as well? Sure, I think that's a great question. And it is very, it's, it's a very fun life journey when I look back at it when I think about it. So I am a hybrid of the East and the West, basically, you know, my upbringing and everything. So I was born overseas in Bangladesh, and I was there until the age of 11. And then I came here. 
So I definitely was exposed to a good dose of the Asian culture and the values there. And then I grew up here in my formative years where I saw what the way of the American life is as well. So in my culture, definitely, you know, a family is is very, very important because it is something that's seen as like basically the other side of the coin of your life. And granted, there are many limiting beliefs in, of the in the East where we when we look at it, we think like, oh, my gosh, it's so backward. It's so ancient versus like what we're doing now. It's so much more freeing. I think being uh, somebody who's coming from the two different cultures, I was able to have like a nice position of where I could like pick and choose of the the values that served me and kind of leave behind or edit and adjust to my life, what fit my need. So yes, I agreed. So in my religion, we don't uh, date before we get married. It's basically, you know, your life is to find that partner who you are going to spend your life with. I mean, divorce is present. It is uh, something that's present. But you know, the goal is to try to make it work to the best of your abilities, right? And so other than that, there's this sweetness to companionship uh, and then the pro- product of creating a legacy, and, uh, like, you know, in children and the progeny that comes before. So somebody carries on your genes, somebody carries on your name and remembers you. So definitely that is there. That so, is so beautiful, Sarah, the way you described this. Yeah. yeah thank so thank you. you for going over all that. So how do you, the, the topic, like, is it? You know, you have to excuse me for like my lack of understanding. So as you reach a certain age and then like your parents would approach you about the topic or how does that come up, you know, on like readiness and in terms of like finding your partner, whether or not through their connections or some other means, how does that process happen? Looking around me, I saw there was a big range of things that happened. Like, for example, my parents, they were love marriage and they were in the in the East Asia at that in Asia at that time. Right. And then go to my grandparents. They are arranged marriage where, you know, they didn't even have any say they, you know, they came from the culture of, oh, you can bear kids now. So it's time to get married, you know, versus I come from a line of women who are very independent and, and very career and education oriented, even though like some women in the past didn't have that high education, they didn't go past eighth grade, they got married in eighth grade, you know, to my parents who they chose each other, they went to college, and I was born in my mom's medical school, like she was like a first or second year student in medical school, and I was born. For me, it was that I knew I wanted to get married. But my mom also instilled the value in me that establish the ground beneath your feet first, you know, before you enter. So basically, first, it was self fortification, self strengthening, and then go and find if you know, keep your eyes open. uh, But do protect yourself, protect your chastity, protect your integrity as you're going around it. So that was kind of the values that I was coming from when I was Uh, getting ready for marriage. And I got married around the age of 23. So I actually started my education process for marriage and preparedness. Like it just came something from within me that I want to have the good things that I see in good marriages around me. And I want to avoid the bad things. So first step was for me to know what I wanted. And then with that process, you know, I was approached by uh, guys in college. I was um, introduced to people through family, friends. I also did the online search for your partner thing as well. So I kind of like tried a whole bunch of things. You went through the full spectrum. Yeah. It was great that you, you wanted to like, you know, you weren't closed off from the sound of it. You were open to all different types of means and methods. And connections yeah. through family and friends. For sure. Find your I, think I, mm-hmm. I got like a good exposure to the different venues out there. And um, at the end of the day, how I met my husband was basically a community effort. You know, my parents sounding the bell that, hey, she's ready. <laughs> <We're> <laughs> she's, uh, she is of the age. <laughs> yeah. 
How does, uh, how, does, how, does that, how does that happen? Um, is there a publication? Oh. Is there like an announcement or? <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I'm you know, to be ready, like, what, of this. what, what, what came, you know, came to a head, you know, uh, for that for you, you know, because, yeah. you know, we talk a lot about, you know, self-care and mm -hmm. also a part of selecting a partner is, you know, we have to know what we want. Or, you know, we think we know what we want, right? Mm -hmm. And through trials and tribulations of modern dating, you know, that kind of get, you know, gets, you know, refined. So it sounds like from you, you had a blend almost from your grandparents, your parents, you know, from an arranged in love. And I would love to hear about like, you know, your viewpoints on each, but it sounded like you had to kind of think about really hard, you know, work on yourself a little bit before you became ready to, you know, have someone come in. Yeah, yeah. No, my my love story starts when I was a toddler. I was in love with MacGyver. I wanted to marry MacGyver, you know, like everybody in my family knew that I was going to be the bride. Like I was known as the bride of MacGyver. I don't know if you guys remember who MacGyver is, but he's this like genius who makes like, I don't know, crazy things. I don't even remember anymore. He know? made anything happen, you know, like yeah. any dangerous situation, any, you know, he just, he was able to think on his feet and be very, 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 uh, how do you say, very cunning and very, uh, he just knew what Very responsive. Very, yeah. I did not understand any of that at that age. It's the age, you know, we, when you just learn to like, you know, I like this shoe, I like that color, that type of thing. But he was on TV. He, he was attractive. I loved him. And my parents threatened me that if I didn't pass my English class, then MacGyver wouldn't marry me. That was the level of threat. That oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's where my love story starts. And then throughout the process, you know, I grew up in South Asian culture. So Bollywood was huge. So a lot of my, you know, love concepts and dreams of how musical you know how magical things are going to be was like I'm going to fall in love and then all of a sudden there's going to be like music in the air and then there's going to be like people just bursting in and we're going to be all like dancing and singing <laughs> you know just like in so, the movies <laughs> so then that was my next level of understanding of love and marriage right and then from that we uh when we moved so there was this like big culture change. And I think there was this concept of trying to preserve our culture and our religious faith. So I was, you know, told like, you know, no, 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 we don't do that stuff. We don't do that dating stuff. If a guy comes and talks to you, you just, you know, look the other way or pretend you don't speak English or something. And just you know, keep, keep, keep your, keep your focus on studying. But I think one of the big things that helped me convey to my family that I was ready was that there was that dialogue and communication. I mean, oftentimes, it's something that's hard for the previous generations to do. You know, previous generation, when we think about the negative aspects of arranged, arranged marriage is that they come and they tell you, you're going to marry so and so, and then you go marry so and so, you know, like the monarchy the stories that you see, I'm sure we all watch Bridgerton, and we feel their heart breaks and stuff. And then we cheer when the love finally conquers all and wins. It's funny you mentioned Bridgerton because that's exactly what was going through my mind when we we're talking about like when your parents like announced that you were ready, you know, like yeah. are we talking, I, mean, I couldn't help but think about like, is this like Bridgerton like, style where you present to the, you know, not necessarily the queen per se, but to the community that, you know, yeah. our daughter is of age, you know? <laughs> no, we do not. At least in my family, we do not, I don't think even in our culture, we don't have that like coming of age, like, oh, you're, you can now announce everybody come bow before the queen. We don't have that. The way it worked for me, because from what I see, I don't see like a particular process, like, you know, a formal thing, like a have a ball, come meet the next available bachelorette and meet the next bachelor. We don't have something like that. It's more that, you know, uh, women talk, it's more of a womanly thing, they're the connected. And then so, you know, you, you want to know other people in your community. So when the time comes, and, you know, for when my mom definitely had a lot of influence, and she was she kept a communi open communication. So that really helped, like, I really looked up to her and listened to her advice. And um, she guided the process. My dad, you know, it's not a manly thing to do. They just, you know, pay the bill when it's time for the wedding to happen. <laughs> you know, that's what the dads are there for. 
And if there's like, you know, families coming together, they're going to talk about the terms of the marriage to make sure that the bride and the groom are taken care of. And, you know, there are the other stuff like in some cultures, uh, even in our culture, you know, the dowry system, sometimes, you know, that is a negative aspect of what is in the culture out there. But coming back to like the concept, the joy of like coming together, it is, I love the part of where, you know, you are not alone. You have a whole tribe looking out for you. And I know, uh, Christine, um, and when you were mentioning about your parents trying to kind of hook you up with somebody, you know, you didn't, you didn't see them. And Colin, you were mentioning like some of the values of the arranged marriage. And so that got me thinking like, you know, um, yeah, as I said, like, you know, the old, the old world model is that you grow together. Marriage was like, you don't only marry one person to another, you're marrying families and tribes to each other. So it was a connection. It was a tr tribal, it was a communal thing versus in modern world or, or, you know, it's in the West. And now it's also coming into the East where the people are, uh, the kids are finding each other. It's a new way, finding that balance, you know, where the kids are happy while the family is also happy. I think that was something that I really appreciate that my family had that open space for us. And so, yeah, so I'm going to pause think, there. I think for me, what I like about the arranged marriage aspect of it is you know, you have other parties. Yes, they're vetting for you. They're filtering, they're screening and all that stuff. It to me, it's a more objective way. It's almost like, you know, we talk a lot about matchmaking on this on this podcast, too. You know, it's a little bit more objective. You're taking the emotions and feelings out of the person that is, you know, needing to be matched in, in a way. And so you're but you know, it's someone else that, you know, has a more intimate, you know, understanding of who you are, right? A matchmaker is not a family person per se. It's, you know, you're talking about within families um, trying to match you up. And I also like the point you mentioned several times is the word community. And you also mentioned tribe. So, and what's interesting is that women come together uh, to connect to come together, essentially. The Loves, Girls, and Stories podcast is a collaboration and co-production between The Chef Doc and White Coat Romance. The Chef Doc is a wellness platform that offers innovative approaches to thriving and offers a self-empowerment book, podcast series, on-demand masterclass series, as well as a brand new app. The app provides self-guided education such as food as medicine, self-care, and resilience. Coaching services are also available, whether you prefer one-on-one -on -one or group type settings. Please go now to your app store, as well as Apple as Google Play to download for free. White Coat Romance is a dating app for healthcare and health-related professionals and students in the U.S. and Canada. It's a lively space where you can find love, companionship, and build meaningful connections with like-minded professionals. If you're single, go to the App Store and Google Play to download and join our vibrant community. As we both serve these amazing communities, we also acknowledge the value of continuing education. Therefore, we're super excited to share an enticing opportunity with our listeners. Our episodes are continuing education eligible. That's right. You now have the opportunity to earn valuable credits while enjoying our content. Rest assured, the episodes will always remain free as we are committed to supporting our communities and amplifying the voices of healthcare professionals. To get a better understanding of how this works, the first three episodes are free to obtain, then the rest of the podcast episodes are at a nominal cost. So you might be asking who can earn credits? Well, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians associates, pharmacists, dentists, as well as dietitians and dietetic technicians. If you find yourself in need of CE credits, we kindly ask you to consider directing your CE funds towards supporting our cause. Your contribution would greatly help us nurture our podcast production and continue to bring you valuable content. We are deeply grateful for your support. From all of us here at Love Scrubs and Stories Podcast, thank you so much for choosing us. And enjoy the rest of this episode. So can you take it a little bit further in terms of you know, do they go through the Rolodex of like mutual, you know, family friends and, you know, like what happens once you are ready and like, what's the next steps after that? Yeah. And then um, how did, yeah, how did it lead to you meeting your husband? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that is a great question. So, and I think it comes down to how do you announce to the community when they're ready? 
So for example, one of the things we get now, like, you know, we're married. So we know, like, I know I have access to guys now through my husband and my husband has access to like bachelorettes through me. So now what will happen is if you have an aunt, like an older auntie or older sibling, or let's say um, if I know that my sibling is about to get married, I would be like, hey, Colin, you're a guy. I'm uh, no, I wouldn't go for Colin. I would go for Christine. Be like, hey, Christine, <laughs> do you have, um, you know, somebody? This is who my sibling is. This is the type of person they're looking for. They want somebody who looks this way. They, you know, this is this is their criteria. Uh, can you keep an eye open? You know, just like it's just like networking. You know, mm-hmm. like um, so internal networking service. Basic. Yeah, this is like. This is pre This era. sounds like matchmaking family style to me. It's very a lot more intimate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just family. So it'll be like, you know, it'll go through several nodes of communication sometimes. You know, like my mom called up like a few of the her aunts and then her friends or, you know, people in the community that were aware of. Sometimes it can be some uh, a leader, somebody in the leadership role at the local mosque and stuff. Or, you know, sometimes the announcement is in like going as far as Bangladesh and sometimes it's staying in the U.S. You know, it can be a global thing. It can be a local thing. Depends on how comfortable you feel announcing yourself or letting people know. You know, I I look at the process of marriage in a more of a systematic and procedural manner because to me, you know, I think relationship, a marriage or, you know, romantic relationship is like probably more than half of your life if you stick with one relationship throughout the process and so it is so important but yet we're so underprepared for it I know we're talking about a lot of the good things here but then there is a truth to it that there is like the dark side of the moon to it you know where you do have family coming together, somebody who's objective, but sometimes the objectivity can take away the personality where, you know, people will be like, hey, here's a photo, you know, of a girl or a guy. What do you think? And you're like, oh, I don't like their skin color or I don't like their body habitus, you know, their weight. And then it's very common. And that's one of the things that turns people off to arranged marriage. There is like a very high level of scrutiny that happens. So it's about being able to find the good that pers- that serves you and leaving behind which would hold you back. And I think that's kind of what I did. And so trans- to transition to the question you asked about how did I go through with it? So, you know, once the word was out, like everybody, like my mom, my aunt, my mom's aunt, <laughs> you know, and the community ants, they all like, you know, they saw us growing up, they, they're always keeping an eye open for you at the same time as you're growing up. So they kind of, you know, like, hey, you want to, you want to consider this guy. So I had a few proposals that came through the family, and then we talked. So it's not just about, you know, you don't get a chance to bond, you do, we did check for chemistry with each other, because one of the more important things to me was the ability to communicate with the other person, you know, you do check for chemistry in that. And so we talked and then if it didn't go through, if something felt like, no, it's not the right match, then it was like, okay, it's not going to work out. And we didn't have to worry about like texting the other person be like, sorry, I don't think we can talk to each other anymore. Sometimes it could be like, you know, you leave it onto like the third parties and they would take care of it and you just go focus on your exam and stuff. So My husband, I met him through a family friend who actually knew us and saw us grow up. And he is actually their family member, member's family member, if that makes sense. (laughs) Family member's family member. Family member's member. Yeah. So it's something like third degree, fourth degree out. So is he your like second family Mm -hmm. member that's twice removed? Is that what it is? Not related to me at all. (laughs) But the matchmaker is like the sister-in-law of my cousin, my husband's cousin. So my husband's cousin's sister-in-law knew me, knew us. And so they connected us. My husband had come to the U.S. at that time to do his graduate studies. He was in the East Coast. I was in medical school. And so, you know, 
mom talked with uh, the people, whoever she spoke to. I'm not privy to like all that information uh, in detail because it doesn't matter. You know, it's like they're doing their stuff. You get used to it. And so they're like, yeah, you know, we did the background check because they did do the background check. Like my mom. Yeah, no need to pay oh, for whoa, a service. Whoa, whoa, no need to pay the, for like being verified or anything. Tell me the that. background check. <laughs> Tell me the background check. All right. The background check was first my mom's resource, her aunt. She did, uh, like, she knows a lot of people. She goes to a lot of places. She has connections, right? To the point that where my husband was doing his master's degree at that time in North Carolina, she found a way to connect to some, like, uncle over there who invited my husband over. And they had a meeting and he talked with him. And then he called back my mom's aunt is like no he's a good guy he's he's straight you know he doesn't do shady stuff and then my mom's aunt talked to my mom and then in Bangladesh they're also doing like background research and stuff like my aunt is like yeah they're in like other side of the country let's figure out what we can he went to this prestigious school in Bangladesh so you know like there's a lot of background check happening no, that's great that, so basically it's like a the, family google search yeah. well by it, the time that more that, than that like FBI like security uh clearance levels <laughs> that sounds pretty intense so by the time that he's presented to you like he's been cleared of like what five six layers or maybe even more of, yeah of, like you of, know like you background and security like, checks yeah I didn't have to spend mm -hmm. my time like figuring out does he have you know, somebody else on the side that I should be aware of or how the family looks like, like all that vetting was done. And so when it came to me, I did the basic Facebook search and be like, yeah, this guy looks okay. Looks okay. I did the Google <laughs> search. Okay, Sarah. So you guys met, what were, what were the first impressions? What was the connection like? Yeah. Let, give us the, this, this love story. You want to hear the, yeah, I want to hear the detail. Yeah. It's, it's a very sad detail. So, um, I, so, you know, like my priority was that I get meet somebody of my faith, but I didn't really particularly care that it has to be Bangladeshi or something. So um, he had just arrived like two years before and I was in the US already for like almost eight, 10 years. So I was basically more American at this point than I was like Asian. And so I see him in his, you know, more of a geeky manner. He, he came across very geeky. And uh, I was in medical school at that time. And he had come to visit for a few hours. And I, as soon as he left, I called my mom. I'm like, Mom, no, no, we're not going to do this. this his that was your first were... reaction. That was, <laughs> yeah, was kind of like mine. Like, except I didn't even meet the guy. I was already like, no. <laughs> yeah, no. My policy was that I'm not going to say no to anybody at the beginning. We're going to go through the process. We're going to go through the vetting. We're going to go through the questioning to see, you know, if there is some potential here for us to have a life because, you know, life is a journey. It's going to evolve over time. Is it something that we can tackle together? So that's what I was looking for, that problem solving skill and who, somebody who can put up with the dragon inside me. So that was my first reaction to my mom and then my mom said yeah it's like mommy I, I don't think so I'm not impressed with him and my mom was like like look at the humility in this boy like he is here sitting in front of you his hand is shaking he, he was drinking glass and his hand was shaking oh was my god he was so, was so nervous so, around you so nervous like uh, like this was my, I've, I've talked with a few other guys before this already, and I'm the first girl that he's talking to. And so he's nervous, you know, this is his first time. I hope he doesn't get angry at me. Which I think our relationship and love evolved over time as we went through things. So my motto at this time would be like, I submitted an application on ERAS for him as my first pick and it got accepted. You know, like we're, we're like matched for life, you know? So, so yeah. what happened? So what happened um, after the in first impress, uh, first impressions? You said no, right? So what, what, what turned around for you? Yeah. You know, in terms of the qualitative, because you had said that you wanted to be set up for life, right? In terms of your outlook, how you want to go about things, the problem solving. So it's a lot of team, team readiness and team building and team cooperation and collaboration, it sounds like, right? And in a romantic partnership. So what was it about him that you're, you're like, okay, I, I think I can actually work with this? Yeah, no, for sure. I think 
it was the statement that my mom said afterwards that kind of woke me up from this prejudice and bias that I had coming into relationship, like where I wanted things to go like a Bollywood movie or I wanted my MacGyver that like brought me back to my senses and made me go through the, you know, the constraint and criteria process that, you know, I call my engineering design extraction from my engineering class that I use to kind of go through these candidates. So, you know, um, some of the important things that were on my constraints and criteria and, and just to fill up a little bit on the background, if you guys aren't familiar with it. So constraint and criteria is one of the steps of the engineering design process where you take an idea that may creates goes from an idea to an actual product. You know, engineering is something that we are using regularly to create, you know, high yield, safe products that improve our lives significantly. And so when I was sitting in my senior year, this is before I met my husband and I got ready for marriage, like I'm sitting listening to my professor and he's just talking about constraint and criteria and like a light bulb goes in my head. I'm like, that is like such a valuable life lesson right here. I'm going to go ahead and create my own stuff with it. Yeah. And you're like, there's definitely parallels. Yeah, definitely. In worlds, yeah. yeah you know, magic and all that, like, songs and stuff in the movies, like, that requires a lot of, like, planning, preparation, and designing and execution. So with my husband selection process, criteria is basically your yes or no. If they don't have it, they're out, you know, and versus um, constraint is more of, like, a gradient process. So you get rated from a scale of 1 to 10, and then the uh, the design that scores the best for what you're looking for, that's the one that you go with. So for me, like, you know, the initial appearance of my husband, how geeky it was, was, you know, it was on the constraint, but then higher on the thing was, how compatible are we? Are we able to communicate what's in our hearts? Are we able to compromise together? So because, you know, life is going to bring challenges. And so are we going to be able to work through it together? And so when my mom said, like, you know, look at this guy, like, he is so nervous. He's so simple, like, you know, give him a chance. She didn't say give him a chance. She said, you know, it's your decision. It's your decision. Like the hardest, you know, whenever moms turn around and say, think hard about it, it's your decision. Like <laughs> inside of you, it goes but like. She, but he like, has her approval. <laughs> yeah. No, no. She was a big proponent for him. She was such a big proponent for him. And I really appreciate that I was able to, you know, depend on her life experience and her wisdom in helping mm -hmm. me guide through this process. And I think a lot of times when people nowadays think about arranged marriage, it's like, I'm going to figure it out. You know, I think that kind of gets in the way of being able to get ahead. You know, why not stand on the shoulder of a giant if you can get there faster? Yeah, so I, I ran through that and we talked and I threw tests after tests after him. And he was basically a knight in shining armor. He was able to pass the tests. He passed and all of the tests. Yeah. And then product, like, product after group. all the all the being verified through family and the yeah, yeah. layers of family and community. And then, I, and then I threw harder tests at him, right? Like, and then the eight years that we were living apart and we really didn't get a chance to quite start bonding all the way until we finally moved in together. But I think it was the, those tr attributes that I was looking for that I gave more of a priority to than my temporary emotions, infatuations, I think that being able to be clear on what I wanted, it helped me land myself with a partner who has brought out a lot of good in my life. You know, um, we have gone through a lot of storms together mm -hmm. and we're still here. And, you know, um, I think it's getting better every day. <laughs> so let's see where it goes. We still fight. We still fight a lot. I love to fight. I tell my husband, <laughs> fighting is like the spice. Yeah, it's well, like that's how you get to know each other better, right? Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing all that, Sarah. That's yeah. so beautiful. What I got, what I got from this was, you know, there was a a lot of trust you had, you know, put in others. You know, you uh, done a lot for yourself, but the other half is really trusting upon people that care about you. And I think that that energy of letting go is a lot is is was pivotal for you and even after the first impression 
you know, a lot, a lot, you know, we're in a swiping culture right now, you know, modern dating is swiping culture. And so, you know, it's, you could have passed on a lot of Prince charming, uh, charmings, or you could have passed a lot of, I don't know what do you call Prompt. it, Cinderella's or whatever. Prompt. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you just don't know until you actually give it a chance and, yeah. you know, and what's the worst case after that, you know, you give it a chance and it still doesn't work, but I think what was pitiful was that you actually gave it a chance based off of someone else that you trusted is what I got from this. And, I, am gonna, uh, I think that's a great insight, but I do want to add one thing to it is that, you know, it's that medical concept, trust, but verify, you know, that comes from an inner confidence. The first trust needs to come from yourself, that you trust yourself enough the second person, the person outside of you that you're trusting, if they fall through, you can still land on your feet like a cat, you know, rather than uh, on your back. Or if you do fall on your back, that you know who that you're having that courage and that faith that you're going to be able to climb back up, you know, that allows you to trust while keeping yourself safe. And trust is something that has to be earned. And so all these people that I have trusted, they had earned their trust, you know, I've, you know, throughout life, it's not somebody, I mean, yeah, I trusted the website there once, and then I talked with somebody, it was a nice conversation, it didn't work out. But I got my trusted group involved, I had my posse, <laughs> if I can. <laughs> you know? And that's how we do things in medicine as well, if you think about it. You know, we trust the science. We trust that the professors who are teaching it to us, the attending that's teaching it to us, you know, knows what they're talking about and that we grow on it. We don't go back to the days of Hippocrates and figure out medicine all over again from ancient medicine. We keep building on what came before us. We take what fortifies us, what strengthens us, and then we make our own decisions. That is the approach I took. I felt confident in that because I knew what I was doing or I took the time to gather my knowledge, to garner my confidence. So I think that's one of the big process of being in a relationship. Are there any uh, takeaway points you want to leave for the listener? Let's just say, you know, they're on their own and, you know, they don't really have a strong, you know, I guess, troops behind them or a strong community and tribe, you know, for them. What would you say for someone that's watching or listening uh, that they can do on their own to kind of, quote unquote, fortify, you know, their own self-confidence in terms of selecting the right partner? Yeah, I think, you know, um, most of the audience here is going to be a doctor or somebody in the in who knows what lifelong learning is, right? And so knowledge is one of the biggest powers you can have. So take that time to increase your, your knowledge and, and know how to pick the right knowledge and, and differentiate it from the knowledge that doesn't benefit you, that holds you back. And then, you know, you're never alone. You have to go out there, put yourself out there. And a lot of times what energy you put out is the energy you're going to attract in exchange. So that means that if you're somebody who is looking for help, go help somebody else. And you soon before you know it, you're going to be surrounded by people who are around you. It's good to have a healthy dose of skepticism, but balance it with optimism. I was called a unicorn in residency for my high optimism. And by the time I was done... <laughs> that unicorn had lost its horn, right? <laughs> <laughs> so put it out there. Recognize your well-wishers. Don't take them for granted. I think a lot of times because of our limiting beliefs and fears, we tend to push aside people that are there for us, that love us, that care about us and want to help us, you know, overcome that. Because you do have people in your life that cares about you. And recently through my, you know, in the past year, I've been kind of developing and transforming significantly in personal growth. And what I've learned is that you need to grow. You need to always be focused on growth and transformation towards something better. It just fills your life with more. So those are the big important things I would say. And, and check yourself every time for a prejudice or like a, unfounded what's the word i'm looking belief, for the thought exactly unfounded belief like challenge yourself before you go challenge the rest of the world so you yeah know that that's a good home. one yeah yes. i like that 
Okay. Really, really great take home points, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. um, your story with us and your journey and um, the process that you went through with partner selection and all the pearls of wisdom that you shared with our audience and, and how about, you know, all the things that you had mentioned to consider that were really, really important. What is the best way to reach out to you? Should someone in the audience want to? Yeah, so I think um, one of the best ways to reach out to me would be by the social media links on Facebook and Instagram for Transcendent You. And that's spelled T-R-A-N-S-E-N-D-A-N-T. And then why you'll do transcendent you. That's something that I'm setting up to kind of help people also just, you know, keep that thirst and energy alive for, you know, chasing their dreams, their limits, their capabilities and become transcending their limits. Well, thank you so, so much, Sarah. Again, it was, you know, personally really good to see you again. And uh, from all yeah. of us, you know, here at the team, at the podcast team, we really appreciate, you know, taking the time and sharing these insights. I think uh, people would really, really benefit, you know, from it, from such a, you know, beautiful and unique uh, perspective. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, on behalf of Christina and I, uh, guys, thank you so much for watching another episode. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like this is a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And until then, and until the next episode, please say goodbye, goodbye to Dr. Sarah. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Bye, guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching and listening to this channel. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you felt like this was a benefit for someone else, please let them know as well. As a reminder, this channel does not offer medical advice. All opinions expressed are ours and our guests only. It is for general informational purposes only and does not replace professional healthcare services. Please consult your own healthcare provider for any medical issues you may have. Until the next episode, whether you're in and out of your scrubs, Please remember to love yourself and others and lead with kindness. Bye.